Hello, hello, welcome to the Bold Moves Podcast. I am the host, Mandy Bryce, and this is episode number 171. If you're new around here, let me explain a little bit about how it works. Each week, I chat with different people who have made bold moves outside of their comfort zones and basically have lived to tell about it, usually in ways that have impacted their own lives profoundly and oftentimes the lives of others, sometimes even around the world. This week, I chatted with Jeremy Griffin, whose assistant or publicist, whoever emailed me and made the introduction, said that he was my favorite entrepreneur that I had never heard of. I love this interview so much because even though there are a lot of things that don't really go along with my philosophy or different things that I am trying to personally do as an entrepreneur or, you know, things that I have learned, some of these go opposite. It's interesting to see the two different sides of what work-life balance is or whether you should focus on one thing or be an everything or there's a lot of that in this and Jeremy is somebody who is definitely being pulled in a lot of directions and by choice but it seems to be working for him so it's really interesting and fascinating for me to have this interview with somebody like this now one thing um, I wouldn't listen to this necessarily if you have children around there are a couple of times during in which he uses some adult language. There are warnings for it, generally speaking, though, so you can do the whole earmuffs thing if you need to. But without further ado, here is my conversation with Jeremy Griffin. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am with Jeremy Griffin today, who his email that I got from his assistant said he was, I think, my favorite entrepreneur that I've never heard of or the best entrepreneur <laughs> I've never heard of or something like that, which definitely grabbed my attention. So <laughs> why well, I, guess, I guess it worked, right? <laughs> why don't you tell me a little bit about who you are <clears throat> and how you've gotten to where you are, the risks you've taken on the way since this is bold moves. Of course, that's what we want to hear about. So okay. Let's hear your story and how you became my favorite entrepreneur I've never so, heard of. <laughs> all right. So this thing has kind of just morphed over the last, uh, literally over the last, really the last 15 years. Okay. Um, into 15 what year it is overnight now. success. A 15 year overnight success. <laughs> We're knocking on the door. You got it. So um, it start. everything started off a long time ago, working with my uncle. Um, he showed me a lot as far as how to put things together and actually go out and grab it right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's a big difference between, you know, being really good at something and then being able to navigate and make things happen. Uh, and, and that was really kind of what opened my eyes to the whole thing. We were driving around the one day and I'm, you know, 15, 16 years old and I'm driving around with them and I'm the nephew, you know, and all that. And, um, everybody's saying, Oh man, he's in trouble again. The company's in trouble. He's, he's going to lose it all and this day and the other thing. And, and of course I'm, you know, I just started working with them and it's a summer job for me and I'm learning a lot. I'm very impressionable, you know, and I'm like, man, like I'm really scared because everybody's telling me this stuff, you know? Yeah. So I'm riding around in his truck and I go, listen, man, I got to tell you, like everybody's saying a lot of really bad stuff about what's going on right now. You know? Yeah. You're a lot, you're a lot of trouble and whatnot. And, and I go, how, how are you going to get out of this? You know, and he, I mean, and didn't even blink an eye. And he goes, well, it's not a matter of how am I going to? He goes, of course I'm going to get out of it. It's just how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost me? <laughs> and, I was, and I swear, like, that has stuck with me forever. Like, whoa, right? Like, what a way to look at things. Yeah. Now, he went too far with that. To the <laughs> where he realized he could screw up just about anything and be able to fix it which yeah. is why he passed away a little while ago, which is why his company that he left behind after all those years, not anywhere near what it should have been. Right. Cause he didn't, he just didn't stay disciplined enough, but that's basically what kicked it all off. Um, started doing my own little side gigs. then when I was 17, 18 years old, uh, classic story of that delivering flyers house to house. Hey, what can I do for you? This, that, you know, that that's kind of the classic story there. Um, by the time I was 21, 22, Went out and got my own insurance. Okay, that was a big step for me. I'm now an insured little minor, small, small construction thing. None of my friends believed me. 
yeah, okay, dude, sure, whatever. I said, no, and it, I was actually shocked. It was a lot cheaper than I thought. Yeah. You know, liability was like $1,000 for the year. <clears throat> they actually let me break it up into payment plans, you know? So yeah. I was like, yeah, man, here it is. So that definitely got me going down then the, the formal road, right? Sure. And, you know, I, I, I got going with that, and I really enjoyed organizing the stuff and building it and, and the planning and all that stuff. Um, started going to school for business because I realized I had a whole lot to learn. Um, a lot of people like to slam school these days. That probably saved my life, honestly, because it was such yeah. a positive environment and it yeah. was very stable and, you know, it, it was, it was a, a source of security for me while that was going on, right? Because the rest of my life was just due to various factors that I don't think we want to get into here. It was an we absolute chaos, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll be the one that can pull it out of me, but... Um, so, so I started to go to school for that. I had a marketing teacher who would start off. I, I knew I wanted to go for business. I wasn't sure in what capacity. And this guy would have us start every single day with, you know, our crazy idea of the week. So I was taking night class because I had to keep working. Mm -hmm. And no matter how dumb our ideas were, he could find a way. Here's how you should position it. Here's who you should partner it with. These are the distributors in that industry. You could probably do this. You might want to name it that. And I'm like, this guy's, and it dawned on me, I go, this guy's probably never been broke a day in his life. Right. Like he's a machine. If he can do that with ridiculous ideas, what is he doing with, you know, existing proven concepts, right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. That's it. I'm going into marketing. So went full steam into that and have just been kind of trying to build that. The, um, the construction thing morphed into real estate over time, okay. which... Now we find ourselves at, you know, 15 years down the road here. We are, I've got a little real estate company. I'm a managing partner in that. And, you know, we've got dozens of rental units that we have to run. That, that honestly, a lot of people in real estate hate property management. Yeah. I love it because that's where you really find out who understands systems and processes yeah. versus who's just good at sales, right? Sure. Like most, most realtors don't like it. I love it because I've got this thing running on cruise control, right? So. Yeah. Um, so we've got that going on and then we've got startup street here in South Tampa, which is just a little tiny company that works with other, you know, pretty small companies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people always say, well, what kind of marketing do you do? And honestly, we do a lot of video stuff. Video is center to just about anything you're doing in marketing these days. But a lot of it is get in when you get in and you, people realize they need help with their marketing. Usually they need help with a lot more than that. Right. And you, you can really get into the, the nuts and bolts of their business with them and really start helping them find different avenues to, you know, marketing at the end of the day is about, you know, in, increasing profitability or increasing revenue or, you know, some people say, well, no, we really just want to raise brand awareness. But if that raise of brand awareness doesn't result in any kind of revenue over the course of a year or three years or whatever your goal was, then guess what? In my opinion, it didn't work. Right. right. So, um, so we do that, you know, last week we had a guy in here for one of the people that I've been working with for a while and I love them. They're a salon company. They just expanded to two locations, which is a humongous jump. Right. Running one is very tough. Jumping to two is where the chaos really sets in, right? I'm and then sure. like they say, the one, one to two is the toughest. From two to five, you've already figured out how to expand, right? right? Because We've done this before. Yeah, um, duplicating. And I had a guy, a rep in here from China to start helping them figure out how do we directly source these hair extensions from overseas and start building our own brand in products on top of running it as a service, right? Because like, I don't, I'm sure some of your listeners listen to Grant Cardone and he said something a long time ago that resonated with me. And he's like, if you're, if you don't have a single product for sale yeah. on your website, you don't, you don't have a real business. He says, you don't really know what you're selling until you can take it and turn it into an actual product form. So that's, I mean, that's what Paul Mitchell did, right? Was they went out and they figured out how to actually make a product that complements the service and branded it around that. And then honestly too, you know, with the, whether you're a salon or maybe you're a deli or any of these other classic businesses um, that make up the majority of businesses in America, right? A lot of the goals is obviously some people want to expand organically. A lot of people just want to franchise, right? Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't have something proprietary, some kind of product lineup, something like that, when you go to franchise, you better have an incredibly strong brand. Right. And I'll be honest with you too, when you look at it like that, can you create in that kind of a capacity as strong of a brand without having some ownership of a product as you can with it? And the answer is not even freaking close. Right. Okay. Bob's Deli is nowhere near his franchisable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Without the specific Bob's, you know, Bob's aunt's cheese line that comes right. along with it, which is the whole key to their whole thing. You know what I mean? They have yeah. more cheeses and every, whatever. Right. So as you can see, I love coming up with the stuff off the top of my head. That <laughs> left a lasting impression with me. Um, so that's where we find ourselves these days. Uh, the, the, I would say, you know, the name of your podcast is Bold Moves. So I had a client that we were working with. I helped uh, get them started six years ago. They were, uh, they make like defense equipment, training equipment, targets, things like that. I worked with them. We launched it out of a guy's garage. I helped them train. Uh, not train, I helped them name the thing, all that kind of stuff, yeah. get through the marketing. Guy wanted to change gears probably, this was probably almost two years ago now. He's got a lot of opportunities. He's like, listen, man, I don't think this thing's working out too well. Um, the company was doing, you know, very healthy six figures after four years of uh, being in business. Not terribly profitable though. And, um, you know, he, he was like, I want to go into, and I was like, come on, man. I was like, listen, give it to me. He's like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, you're just going to close the doors, you know, yeah. give it to me. Let me, let me see what I can do with this. Cause I had already turned around a couple of little real estate portfolios mm -hmm. and working with the businesses, the marketing capacity has always, you know, been one of those things where, like I said, you get in and you think you're just going to do the marketing. Right. But when you're, and when you're working with existing established businesses in your community, you really get in there, yeah. you know, like you're part of meetings and you start to see all the dysfunction and all that. And, you know, I always say the next business that's not horribly dysfunctional when you get behind the marketing and behind the doors will be the first. Okay. <laughs> so I'm straight up. I have never worked with one that is not a mess when you get behind it. Right. So, <clears throat> so I got the opportunity with Grizzly. I was like, you know what? Give it to me. You're just going to close the door. So we came up with a really amicable agreement and I jumped on it. So I grabbed this little tiny manufacturing company and that is an entire different world from yeah. the service world. I mean, importing materials and manufacturing and putting it together, getting it in the packaging and getting it out there and dealing with all the shipping and logistics and the wholesale versus retail and mm -hmm. to distributors and there's enough room in your margins. And this one's got upset about that and this, that, and the other thing. I mean, it is a major, 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 major undertaking, right? But I had to, I had a benefit for that one because I was knee deep in that industry already from working with them with the marketing for four years straight. Mm -hmm. And I was knee deep in that product specifically because I had been there since the beginning, right? Which those are two pretty unique things when people go out to buy a company to uh, turn it around or whatnot. You know, like if I was going to go out and buy, you know, the three location laundry mat company, well, I don't know anything about laundry. I might just think that there's something here that I can do and maybe I can get it turned around. But a lot of it, that is gut with this here. I almost basically, I, I knew exactly where the problems were and I knew how to get us through it and all that. And it just needed a little bit of tweaking. And, um, you know, my goal was to take that from a company that basically nobody had heard of that was, you know, having, uh, uh you know, having some, having some internal issues, if you will. Right. But take it, get it turned around and turn it, literally turn it into an industry icon in 12 months, sure. which would be unheard of, right? Well, we're finding out that 12 months is a very, very aggressive timeline on that. <laughs> uh, was probably too much so, but I will say with that crazy event that we have launched to be the lifestyle side of this company, I just got back from a conference and we raised probably quote, close to a quarter of a million dollars in sponsorships for this event. Wow. So this event's going to be a home run. And just so your listeners know, we basically have combined a Tough Mudder obstacle course with a live fire shooting competition. And we found a way to do it where it's extremely safe, too. I was going to say, that sounds it like sounds, about as great of an idea as I've heard it, in my hometown. It, it, it's, it's an ass-throwing <laughs> bar. 
<laughs> and I'm like, you're combining drinking and axe throwing in Milwaukee. Right. Sound. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. I'm like, I don't know how to hide the fact that this sounds like a terrible idea. So right. how did you decide to make it safe? Well, and that's, so that's, that's why when I did the very first one, which was an initial attempt to do it, and then I was going to partner it, you know, with the company I'm marketing for. This was two and a half years ago. Humongous learning curve on that. Um, you know, I've, if you want national fame, you should be willing to accept national humiliation in <laughs> That's return fair. in order yeah. to get there, right? And uh, I wouldn't say that that event was a, quote, national embarrassment, but there was a lot of people all over the country that heard about what a horrible job I did putting okay. that first one on, okay? And I now stumbled through it, though. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it was a big risk. And, and I spent a lot, and I lost a lot of money on it, too, but... I was like, this is really cool. I think that this industry needs this because the typical shooting competition is not exactly a spectator friendly situation, right? Okay. It's, it, it's fairly passive. There's a lot of standing around and I'm looking at things like Tough Mudder and Spartan and, you know, looking at like military training guys going through boot camp and mm -hmm. nin American Ninja Warrior. You know, we had a couple of guys that came out from that to help me with the first one. Um, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? So we yeah. did it humiliated myself. Absolutely horrible. It was all true, but it was all very embarrassing. And the thing was, everybody's like, oh man, boy, that was a disaster. I bet, I bet you're not doing that again. And I'm like, well, you all didn't see what I saw. Okay. You're, <laughs> you're like, focusing on all. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I'm like, you guys are focusing on the bad. What I saw was we logistically found out how to combine those two yeah. in a safe manner. Like we cracked that code finally. Yeah. And a couple of people from the industry actually flew in to check it out. And they're now my partners coming up with the drop zone tour, the North American tour that we're putting together. Um, so they, they flew down, they saw it like, wow, dude, you actually figured it out. You weren't kidding. And I said, yeah, man, I've spent a lot of time on this. So that was the initial one that was a basically an absolute disaster with the exception of we learned a lot. The one that we just did in January was phenomenal. Okay. okay. Hundreds of people all saying that they've never had that much fun in their life. Absolutely exhausted event went off without a hitch. Um, I mean, just standing back and watching it as you have all of these people on the obstacle course and right. there's different shooting stations and they're all running in there and you've got, you know, range officers everywhere. It's a heavily, heavily monitored event, right? And right. Nobody's doing anything terribly complicated except, you know, picking up that shotgun and dropping the targets in front of them and then setting it down and getting back on the obstacle course, right? So right. the shooting aspect is not terribly complicated, but I don't want it to be. This is not... Right. You know, this is not for 007 here. This is a mass market event, right? Yeah. So, so we did that. That was a raging success I, that, that I almost could not believe looking at it. I don't, no clue how we put that together. <laughs> you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I don't think that was probably the most taxing three to four weeks of, of my career in quite a long time. And I'm okay. used to working a lot. Um, but we did it. And it was a little messy getting it through, but we did it. It worked. So now we're putting this tour together. So I've got this North American tour coming up with obviously Grizzly is one of the main sponsors of that. Mm -hmm. And when we're promoting it at this conference, I was just at like a lot of people were like, Oh yeah, I heard about that. Heard about you. Heard about Grizzly, all this. So it's my kind of an entrepreneur I've never heard of. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what I told them, right? That is a good, I'm, I'm going to give her credit for that. That is an incredible headline. <laughs> I, I think that that, I love that, right? That's very intriguing when you read it. So definitely, I would open that email, I guess, right? <laughs> so that's where we're at with that. Um, and that obviously will have to be its own company, the event portion of it, because we can't even just basic insurance, you know, reasons sure. running a manufacturing and an event aspect through the same thing. So that will be numero four there cool. with three different offices. And, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's where we find ourselves. I have no clue how it happened. I don't know how it's <laughs> staying together. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. It's a lot right now. Yeah, it is a lot. There's it's, it's a struggle to try to maintain your sanity while all this is going on. It's yeah. a struggle for everybody else that's around me to try to maintain their insanity, their sanity while this is going on. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to do the best you can and, and hope for the best, honestly, you know, because somebody was asking me the other day, they're like, well, with all that going on, how do you make sure things don't slip through the cracks? And I'm like, you don't like, right. there are a lot of things that slip through the cracks on a daily basis when you have 
all of this stuff going on, or even if you just have one company, but you're just going a hundred miles an hour with it. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like there is no, there is no system on earth that assures an extremely aggressive mindset and business plan is not going to be messy. Right. It just doesn't exist, you know? So you just deal with it as it happens and, you know, try to put the pieces back together. And <clears throat> that's basically the biggest struggle I have right now is staying organized and figuring out what's going on. I laugh and I say, well, I know it's time to pay my bills at home because the water got turned off. <laughs> oh, I guess I should get that bill paid that, you know, and then I, somebody was like, are you kidding me? And I literally walked out to my mailbox. I was like, I haven't even had a chance to check my mail in a week. I don't know how they're fitting more stuff in here. Right. So <laughs> it's chaotic. It's very stressful. Um, but it's very fun at the same time. Sure. You know, and I just accepted that a long time ago that if you want all the perks that come with this, you have to accept all of the bad stuff too. It's like right. anything else. Right. So, yeah. So that's where we find ourselves. Well, I love that. I love that. First of all, you're being so open about the struggles that you're going through even oh. right now. So oh. you're not just like, a, oh, it was rough for a while back in the day. <laughs> no. you know, I'm on my yacht and drinking, you know. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's a whole, it's a whole other story once you get out of theory and you get yeah. into application, right? Yeah. And, and I don't care what you're talking about, whether it's relationships with a significant other right. or it's business or it's political or whatever. When you get out of theory and into application, everything changes. You know? <laughs> and, and, and my God, the amount of people that tell me on a regular basis, they're like, well, you know, you really need to focus on your processes. And what you need to do is develop systems and processes and learn how to learn how to scale, Jeremy. And I'm like, no kidding. Like, <laughs> I'm working on this on a daily basis. Like there's right. just, there's no getting around the headaches. Yeah. You know? I mean, I don't want, I'm not trying to, to build this so that I never have to do anything. Right? right. I'm trying to build this so that all of them, so that they're absolute monsters. Yeah. You know, like I have, I have no desire to get any of this stuff to the point where I work five hours a week, where I have a four hour work week <laughs> and I can sit on the beach and drink margaritas. Like that would be suicide for me. <laughs> a, I don't need that much time. Right. And B, I, I enjoy it too much. Yeah. You know, I mean like just conversations like this. I mean, it's that this is literally why I'm here. Yeah. Is to build things and do all of this stuff. And, you know, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it any other way. So yeah, when you're trying to go from where we're at to something that is a industry wide leader in all of those categories I just talked about. Yeah. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of hours involved. I don't care who you are, you know, and, and, and honestly too, there's a lot of stuff where, well, you need to develop processes and systems and all that. There is a lot of stuff where we're at right now where literally I'm the only one that can do it still. Right. Like we're not anywhere as near to the point of size, even close, where I can start delegating things that will take the company to the next step, whatever that happens to be. Right. You know, like there is one human being that could go to this conference and raise all of that money for this tour. That's it. Right. You know, even my partners in it can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they're like, yo, we got, we got a free booth. Come and do your thing. Okay. And I was like, you got it, man. I'm there. Right. So <laughs> there's just a lot of stuff like that, that there's no way for me to delegate my way out of it. Mm -hmm. So then it comes down to, well, how much do you want to put on your plate? And I'm like, I want to, I want so much on my plate that things are falling off every single week. <laughs> I will gladly deal with the, with that chaos rather because I've been in positions before when I was younger where there, there is stress from having too much to do. And then there's stress from not having enough to do. Okay. Right. And the latter is much, much worse yeah. than the first. I will take that every day of the week. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've inherited a little bit of your uncle's, uh, we can, we can make it work, fix it. Attitude. Tons of it. Yep. <laughs> and I love that you, you know, my husband makes fun of me because I was a teacher for six years and that's what I wanted. Like I went to school for education and at one point I told him that my elementary school gym teacher, I knew she worked at 
this buffet restaurant in the evenings. And he was like, you knew that she needed to have a second job working at the buffet and you still were a teacher? <laughs> like, what the heck? Like, you knew you weren't going to make any money. Yep. I was, it's like the same thing with you. Like, you saw your uncle, you saw what everyone was saying about him. Yep. Not the uh, yacht part of entrepreneurship, and you still are like, sign me up. <laughs> yep, that looks like a horrible idea. Let's go in that direction. <laughs> I love it. So you've mentioned so many different businesses. Um, if someone wanted to find you online to see like what you're doing, see is there a hub for everything, or where um, people find you? That's okay. So. That's another interesting thing is it's pretty, when, when things are that diverse, it's pretty difficult to make some kind of a hub right. for it with a definitive feel. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is to go fi find us on Facebook and Instagram for Startup Street is the name of the marketing company. Grizzly Targets is the name of the manufacturing company. Drop Zone Gunner is the name of the event that we're putting together. And I don't really do much with the real estate, but the name of that company is Elite Reality. So okay. that's basically all that they can do. Putting a hub together for all of that and the quote personal branding aspect of things is, um, is difficult yeah. when you are in so many different areas like that. You know, right. I don't know how, I don't know how anybody really does that and creates a real cohesive message with the exception of I'm all over the place and I like being all over the place and <laughs> you know, <laughs> here's a yeah. here's a few things we got going on and then I'll be honest with you I've always loved that show The Prophet with Marcus and how he can go in and figure things out and you know and so when people because I get that a lot these days right and and people are like man you're all over the place you got to pick something and focus on it yeah. And I'm like, I don't see Marcus doing that. You right. Know, I think the same thing about J-Lo and Richard Branson. <laughs> right. You know, like they see opportunities. They say, I can do something with that. And they just go into it. Right. You know, so, I mean, you know, if, if I achieve the financial success that comes along with that at some point, that might be nice. But <laughs> I mean, in the, in the meantime, like, here's the thing. I, and I told, I told a friend of mine this the other day and I said that and he goes, yeah, but bro, you got to understand, like, you know, Marcus is 20, 25 years older than you. Right. And I said, well, you got to understand that he got going like that somehow. Yeah. Okay. And, and maybe I'm not nowhere as near as profitable with any of it as I should be because of the fact that I'm trying to do a million and one things in a million and one different industries and all of that. So, you know, maybe that is the case, but I, I kind of am equating it at this point to, you know, learning to drive on an old rusty five speed. Mm -hmm. You know, and then eventually when you get to the point where you can kind of combine a few things and get a little bit more niched out, all of a sudden life is a lot easier. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll be honest, what we're doing with, with Grizzly is just, I mean, it is absolutely amazing what we've been able to do in one year. We got the product lineup completely turned, turned around, got it all figured out. All the numbers are figured out. Everything is getting streamlined. This event was an absolute monster to put together, and that is the lifestyle thing that we needed with it. We launched it. It was a success. It's sponsored up. So within 12 months, I'm well on my way to taking this thing and fixing it internally and fixing it externally. And once this tour stops, there will be very few people in that industry that has not heard about this. Uh, once the tour starts, that have not heard about the company, right? Right. So when you get that much attention uh, and that much, they make that many eyeballs on you, that only further helps the sales, you know, and obviously the ticket sales with our partnership will be 50-50. Uh, every single event that we put on should generate anywhere from forty to sixty thousand in ticket sales. Mm -hmm. And you know, my my partners think I'm insane with this, but they're like, "Well, how many are we trying to do?" I'm like, "We're doing one a month." And they're like, "Well, I think maybe if we do, th I go, no, listen, when that because I have to buy a trailer for all the obstacles and stuff." I said, "When that trailer leaves, I don't want to coming back home. Okay, <laughs> I want this thing to go and go and go." So by the time it's all said and done, it will be pretty incredible what we've been able to do. In such a short period of time, when you're talking about like major corporate turnarounds and stuff like right. that. And for me, it doesn't really seem like that because I'm so used to the craziness at this point, right? right. Like, like, well, what we do with the video stuff, I love to go and capture, basically it's like the, the, um, the daily V, 
you know, yeah. the whole model, right? We're going to go to the businesses. We're going to capture a day in the life. We're going to make a really cool seven to 10 minute vlog out of that. We're going to dice a lot of it up and make all of your graphics and your, your short micro content out of it. Try to fill their social feeds up with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. But you can't go in and really plan much when you do that. You don't want to, right? right? Because you want the, spont the spontaneity of it. Yeah. Well, the majority of people that are in film world would freak out over that. Yeah. What is our agenda? What are we doing? Blah, blah. Well, we're just going to show up and we're going to play it by ear. I don't like this. I need to know <laughs> what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And the majority of people that are in, from the film industry, would that would completely scramble them. Mm -hmm. And we're like, this is now the norm. Yeah. Right? So you get anything even close to resembling an outline of a day now. And it's like, oh, man, this is going to be an easy one. <laughs> so so that's you know that's kind of where we're at with you know as far as the craziness goes and it really you know cutting your teeth on you know cutting your teeth on you know a different cloth than than what everybody is used to cutting it on right and then when you finally get to the point where you're supposed to be what what is stressful and what is tough is such a different pain threshold than what the typical than what honestly than what your competition is used to dealing with right you now have a leg up forever Got right it. and that's like that's why you hear gary that's why you hear gary say all the time that he thinks immigrants have a a, a leg up on people that were born here right because yeah. they come over and their mindset is so much different and their expectations are so much different mm -hmm. and that is the truth too is you're an immigrant i think you're like something like seven times more likely to become a millionaire Really? If you were born here, I mean, it's, it's very startling when you get into it, but that's why he says that all the time, because that's what that is, is their, what their idea of pain threshold is, is yeah. so much radically dip, more different. That makes and sense. when you do start going through, you know what I mean? Like what, what most people would continue consider a stress level of eight yeah. to this other person, that's only a four. Right. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. And I've definitely the first world problems, right? We all right. See, see that a lot. Right. So yeah. I've definitely felt before that my own comfort has held me back just because I'm like, well, I'm still doing all right. You know, yep. <laughs> like I don't, so I can, I, I can see how that would make sense. Now you've referenced Marcus, you've met, referenced Gary V, Grant Cardone. So obviously you're educating yourself in business Always. outside of school and such. So I'm wondering what book recommendations you have for our listeners. Um, Book recommendations. Uh, I'm, I'm currently reading the one by the guy who started Sam Adams. Okay. Which is extremely interesting because that was a bare bones. Let's start locally. Let's take over as much of the local market as we can. Mm -hmm. Let's start a slow expansion, but keep it controlled. Um, and you know, his, his outlook is extremely interesting because he came at it from a position of a guy who was really ready to just work at it okay. and go all in himself. Um, he didn't start it with the sole goal of let's figure out. And again, here we go back to four hour work week mindset, which just drives me absolutely insane. <laughs> he didn't start it with the goal of, you know, let's see how much of this I can delegate to make my life as easy as possible. And, you know, we'll just kind of fiddle around with it every now and then he started it with, we're going to do this. I'm going to work 90 hours a week to make it happen. And, you know, and, and they, the, the first real, the first real, uh, you know, benchmark, I guess you could say that he put together was, you know, I want us to outsell the leading import, which I think at that point was Heineken or something like that, which would, okay. would have been a monumental task for those guys at yeah. that time. And he, you know, he basically said, I don't care if it takes us a year or two years or 25 years. Like, that's what we have to do with this, right? And mm -hmm. I, think the, I think the name of the book is Quench Your Thirst. That is, a, I've, I've really enjoyed that one. And, and I'll be honest with you, that is very similar to what I'm doing with Grizzly with what I call as a tactical takeover of, you know, massive B2B outreach, phone outreach uh, with, with, you know, CRM systems in place and literally just following up. I say follow up until they file a restraining order. Right. <laughs> until you hear, until you hear, no, stop calling. Like, keep calling. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, don't be abusive with it, but just a continual, systematic approach to an industry as a whole, and slowly build. Right. Um, that was a really good one. Probably one of the better ones that I've read recently was Shoe Dog 
by Phil Knight, who started Nike. Yeah, Nike. That was an incredible story, simply because it takes you through, he literally takes you through everything. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he did not, he was a runner, okay? He liked to run. But who would have ever thought, you know, that he would be in, end up in manufacturing. And he went overseas and they tried to source a few things. The really funny thing about that one is that their company was called, and this is how I ended up with Startup Street, honestly, their company was called, uh, it was like American Shoe Company mm-hmm. or something like that. And I mean, it was just an awful name, right? I mean, just horrible. And they were trying to come up with a new name for it and they had a, a decent sized order uh, down in Mexico at a manufacturing facility, ready to get go. What are we putting on this shoe? Yeah. And there was like, there was two suggestions that it came down to. And one was Falcon, which everybody at his company liked. And then he like, he was obsessed with this name called dimension six, okay. which made no sense whatsoever. And he loved it and everybody <laughs> hated it. And somebody came to him at the very last minute and was like, Hey, have you ever thought of Nike? which is the Greek goddess of victory. And it literally just went with it on a dime. Like thought about it for a day after, you know, literally almost a year of pondering this, heard it a day later said, screw it, go with it. We don't have any more time to waste. Boom. There you go with Nike. Wow. Yeah. So that is a really, really, really interesting, um, interesting uh, scenario that happened as far as how he named that company. So Phil, so Phil Knight basically just changed the name on the fly. I thought that was absolutely incredible when he did that. Um, one day, you know, the order's ready to go. Two names it came down to. Somebody mentioned Nike's the Greek goddess of victory. He said, screw it, go with it, let's do it. That's yeah. how they came up with Nike, okay? Um, when I heard that, I was like, wow. The name, so check this out. This is really funny. The name of the marketing company for years was half cool, half crazed (laughs) promotions and advertising, okay? Because I was like, we're going to do the craziest stuff ever, and it's going to be super cool and all that, and I'm going to go so far into left field with it that people will never forget the name. Well, I found out fairly fairly quickly that if your name is that crazy sounding, guess what? You don't even get the appointment, Okay. So, and if you really want to get to the point where you're not just doing these little one-off marketing jobs and you're actually building a real business, then you better be able to get CEOs comfortable enough to pick up the phone and call you. Okay. So then we tried to shorten it down. I was like, no, I love it. I got to stick with it because you know, I'm sentimental like that. And I was like, no, we got to stick with it. So then we tried to shorten it down to HCHC advertising, which is the most obnoxious thing to try to say <laughs> on the face of nobody can pronounce it. It sounds like a big slur every single time. So honestly, while I was reading that book, I was like, Oh my God, that's how I, I set the book down. And I said, I've always hated this name. We're changing the name. Yeah. So I just changed the whole entire name to all of this stuff like a year ago. Okay. A year and a half ago. And people were like, well, that's kind of risky. I'm like, man, it's not risky. Like nobody in the grand scheme of things, nobody knows who we are. Yeah. You know, I send out an email blast to everybody. Hey, we changed the name and then, you know, send it out again to make sure they got it. That's it. Yeah. There's no, there's no brand equity in something this small, you know, right. like people's, people's egos on what their brand stands for and is worth. I mean, just absolutely fascinates me. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, of course we just changed it. I hated it. <laughs> like, well, listen, unless we were talking about some serious money there for what this was worth, it is well worth me not hating the name of my own company. Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> the, really, the really cool thing, too, about Nike reading that was that even when they were doing, okay, so here's something neat. Do you know that Puma and Adidas were, are actually owned by brothers? No, I didn't. Yes, that. that company had actually started with the two of them, and then one broke away. So for anybody that's always thought that Puma and Adidas seem like they're kind of the same company, it's because the two people that owned it and started were freaking brothers, right? So wow, do they so get along? Kind of, I'm right, no. exactly. Right? <laughs> so, so that was kind of neat. But the thing, so with Nike, they take you through the whole story. That company, believe it or not, was never really profitable until they went public. Okay. They were selling a ton of sneakers, a ton of it, but they're still having to go to the bank for more money. Yeah. So you know, that's something that I think a lot of people, especially when they're getting started out, can really take from it. 
when they're reading that is that, yeah, sales are great, but if you're really going to try to build something and you're going to try to build it big, profitability is really the only thing that matters, mm -hmm. right? You can have five, six, seven, eight, ten million $10 million a year in sales. But if at the end of the day, especially if you're actually going to make something, if you don't have the extra cash in the bank and the profitability to order more materials right. to get it in to make the next run, you're, you're, you're failing, right? right? And that was his whole model was to, you know, that's where it came in, just do it. His whole thing was, we just can't lose. And people go, well, what is, what is losing? He goes, I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> But we can't We're not going to do it. We're not going to find out. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, he goes, it doesn't matter what it, I don't know. We just can't lose. So, so they just kept going with it and they kept plowing away at it. And I mean, and this went on for a really, really long time. Right. And then he, he gets very candid at the end where he talks about when they went public and all of a sudden he went from trying to piece all of this stuff together for 10, 15 years, 20 years, maybe. And going, you know, they got thrown out of a couple of banks, you know, going to, to the banks and like begging and pleading for more money. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, living like that, just, you know, every month you don't know what's going to happen because when you get to the point where they were at your, it's one thing if you're like, you're, you're really small and you're starting something and it doesn't work out. Okay. Well, right. that's fine. If you're at the point, you know, where you have assets and things like this, and you've got, you know, a lot of people on payroll that are depending on you. And I mean, the, the stress of that failing, the bigger you get, the stress of what failure looks like is just compounds, right? Mm -hmm. So he's very candid at the end, though, when he says when they finally got their big payout and they got the millions and all that, he goes, I don't know what happened to us. He goes, but everybody got a lot different. He goes, I went through a whole phrase uh, or a whole phase where I wore my sunglasses 24-7, <laughs> Nighttime in a restaurant, I'm still wearing my sunglasses. He goes, looking back at it, I have no idea why, but all of a sudden I got all that cash and I was just too cool for everybody, right? So I thought that that was really cool that he went into that and admitted that, you know, the money kind of turned him into a little bit of a D bag there for a little while, right? And, yeah. and you know what I mean? And he, and he owned it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, he, he really, when I got to that part in the book and read that, I was like, okay, so if you're being candid about that, then all this other stuff that I'm assuming is authentic, but you never know, right. is probably pretty authentic too then. Yeah. You know? So I, I would really highly recommend Shoe Dog by okay. him because it really, it really outlines the struggle of business in general. And you can be 15 years down the road and your sales are awesome, right? but that doesn't mean that you're making it. Right. You're just, you're spending it just as fast as you're getting it, you know, sure. and only at that point you have a lot more to lose if it's, if it messes up. Right. So, right. so I'd recommend that. And then uh, obviously anything by Gary V is good. I think yeah. probably most of your listeners know that um, the guy that started tough mutter has a book that he did that came out about six, eight months ago. Okay. And I think it's like, I think it was, it takes a tribe or something like that. Okay. Really, really good book. Awesome. We'll really, make sure really that's good book. verified as the correct title and pop that in the show notes. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah, I'm not sure if that's the title or not, but that was uh, that was a really enjoyable. And again, when people are willing to go into their failures and like just you know, say it point blank, I'll be honest, it, it gives me comfort seeing that. Yeah. Because I'm like, okay, cool. Well if if these guys went through all of this and that's what I'm going through, then that doesn't mean that I'm nuts. It's just, <laughs> right. So, or you're also nuts in the same way as or I'm, exactly, or, or, it, it, okay. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or I'm also nuts. Uh, Gary was down here in Tampa, did a speaking event about two months ago mm -hmm. and he's standing up there and you know, he, he has all the millennials. How many people in this room are millennials, you know, and about yeah. four fifths out of them raised their hand. And he goes, okay, and how many of you are, you know, running your own business at this point? And, you know, four-fifths of all of them raise their hands. Yeah. I mean, he, this is why I love him, because he just loves to mess with people, right? And he goes, right. okay, that's great. He goes, 90% of you won't be raising your hands in two years. Yeah. And everyone's like, damn, man, like, that's not why I'm here, man. I want to feel good, right? <laughs> right. Motivation but is speaking by he, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> he, he said, you know, and I think it was at his speaking thing that he said that, but... 
maybe it was one of his other talks. I have a hard time keeping it all straight sometimes, but mm -hmm. you know, he's like, I know everybody's getting into this because they think it's cool and whatnot and all that, but you know, that's where he dropped. It. And I don't know if we're allowed to cuss on your show or not, but <laughs> if we're not, just keep it out. he goes, I eat shit for a living. You uh -huh. know, he goes, none of you saw on my way over here, the six phone calls I had to take that were all bad news. Yeah. And you're just, you know, he likes to say he's putting out fires daily. Yeah. Right. And yeah. He says, I don't know everybody thinks this is real cool and whatnot. He goes, but you have to put some serious thought into it, which is, is this just simply a personality disorder? Hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, is it, is there something, is there a glitch going on in there that would possibly make somebody want to subject themselves to that level of stress for their entire life simply to say, I built something? Right. Maybe that, maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> I, mean, I read something the other day that Elon, okay, is sleeping at the factory because they are so messed up right now. He said he's sleeping at the factory most nights. Oh, Him, man. the guy that started PayPal, okay? Right. I mean, and there, he doesn't have to do that. Like, what are you doing? Like, what is the matter with you? Yeah. You know, but you find he's these guys. in a four-hour work week. <laughs> no, no. And, and honestly, most, most all of them are. Right. You know, I mean, that book sold a lot of copies because that sounds fantastic. I read it. <laughs> yeah. I bought it and I was like, wow, so I can just outsource everything uh -huh. and not have to work at all. And it's like, yeah, you can do that and you can probably make a nice little income out of it too. Mm -hmm. But you're never going to have a company that's making 20 million a year, 50 million a year, 100 million a year with that as your philosophy. It's right. just not going to happen, right? So it, it depends what you want. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. It's just not for me. Sure. And I won't lie. I get sick of people telling me that it should be for me because yeah. I'm like, no, you don't know idle me, okay? Idle me is not a happy scenario, yeah. okay? So like stop telling me about processing and scaling and all this stuff and like just, you know, let's just do this, right? Sure. So, <clears throat> but yeah, I read it. And I was, I was in awe after I read it. And yeah. then I realized really quick that normal life does not function like this. So <laughs> get back on the bookshelf and let's get back to work, right? Well, work is obviously a huge part of what you're doing and you're doing a wide variety of different things, as you've mentioned, where it would be really hard for you to have a cohesive lifestyle brand. Through all of that, I'm wondering, and if you don't know the answer, it's totally fine, but I always am curious what people define as their purpose. So obviously for some people that changes, that could be right. something they're just like, I have no idea. I haven't had time to think about it because I'm doing so much. But right. what do you feel is your purpose? Um, I think that that probably changes as time goes on, Sure. you know, over the course of your life. But like literally for right now, what it is, is exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, which is trying to build things and create infrastructure for future growth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not being afraid to take on new opportunities mm -hmm. and just focus on honing my craft of being able to come into legit physical companies mm -hmm. and start them and or fix them and, you know, create opportunities through that that are kind of an interesting, you know, fi find niches and create the opportunities and honestly just prove that I can do that. Right. Yeah. And then once I'm done with this one here, so as far as creating the personal brand, I won't lie, like once we get done with this Grizzly turnaround, I mean, this is going to be a humongous success story for that right. industry. This is going to be one of the all time great turnaround stories that that industry has ever seen. Sure. And I will have been able to put it together fairly quickly for all intents and purposes. Now I'm killing myself doing it, okay? <laughs> that is going to literally be a, a success that I can hang my hat on for the rest of my life. So. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what the whole purpose of everything right now is, is to literally do exactly what we're doing and keep going at it and try to be smart and try to be strategic, Sure. you know, and, and just do, and just do the best that you can, you know, and stay positive. Uh, I was saying the other day, it's incredible how much different a day can look when you literally say, I'm going to be the most positive I have ever been in my life. I am I'm a very positive person, but I have never tried that specifically. And as you said that, I could imagine the impact. I bet that's right. Nice. Like when you yeah. literally wake up and you go, I am going to try to make, to behave today the most positive manner that I've ever behaved before. Yeah. It has an effect, you know, now 
life has a way of sabotaging that, <laughs> usually by 9 a.m., okay? But, um, but, you know, the power of positivity is very real. Yeah. And, uh, you know, especially when you're, when you're in scenarios, you know, like we're in, it's, it's really the only thing that you can, that you can try to hang your hat on because right. everybody is in the trenches. Yeah. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but that light seems like it's a little ways off. Now, in the grand scheme of life, it's not that far off. Right. But I'll be honest, when you're in it, people are like, oh, my God, with, oh, my God, it's so exciting what you guys are doing over there. And this, oh, oh, and I get these messages all the time. Oh, my God, I want to come hang out with you. And, can we, and I'm like, listen, it sure? looks like it. But when you're <laughs> in it, it is just, and a lot of people hate the word, it is just a grind. That's yeah. it, you know, and it's slow and it's methodical and it's determined. And it is just not exciting. Now, when you look back at a whole year and you put a highlight list together, that looks exciting. Right. But when you're in it, no, no, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it is just, it is a grueling, slow moving method, uh, method, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and that's it. So there's, there's no, there's no way to glamorize the day to day. Right. Except trying to be positive about where it's possibly heading. Yeah. I, I love that. That's so true. Now shifting gears away from potentially, I guess, hopefully there's positive outcomes behind it, but I'm wondering what the scariest thing you've ever done is. Oh God. Um, <laughs> I, I've done a lot of things that most people would probably consider pretty terrifying. Um, That's part of what makes this conversation or this question so interesting with the right. people that I interview because it, you know, like you just said, a lot of other people would consider it scary, but you're like, no, this is what we have to do. Right, so right. That's kind so that's what makes it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I, it, I don't, won't, won't get into it too much, but I definitely got into a decent amount of trouble growing up, you know, okay. and so a lot of that, just that whole entire scene that I was in for a while would probably scare the living bejesus out of most people. Okay. okay. Um, but again, you get through it. And now that is now your th new threshold for what's crazy. Um, what's scary. Right. Right. I would say though, honestly, um, most recently was probably as far as professional business stuff goes, I would say probably putting on that first drop zone event, um, yeah. three years ago. I mean, you know, you've got a bunch of people. Sh I've no, I've never put on a shooting event before. I'd put on a handful of different, you know, smaller conferences. I put on an en energy conference at USF and a handful of other stuff downtown and things like that. Never put together something like that. To have all those pieces coming together with everybody telling you you're insane and realizing you're going to have people shooting AR-15s and pistols and shotguns all over the place and mm -hmm. you've got obstacles and who's going to manage this and what's it going to, you know what I mean? Like that, that was really really nerve wracking, especially because leading up to it, it was getting incredibly clear to the handful of people that were involved with me that this was going to be a messy, messy execution. And yeah. they all bailed. Okay? okay. They all bailed to get away from it. So when it came time to do it, it was just me. Right. Okay. So that right there was by far, I would say, as far as nerve wracking, one of the scarier things that I've done. Um, you know, the, the thing is that I, that I always say with, with people that are like, man, I don't know how, I was just at a board meeting for uh, something that has to do with an event with a p potential venue and they wanted a board meeting and all this stuff. And the board meeting was ugly. It was ugly before I presented. It got really ugly when I presented. Okay. And, <laughs> ah, what are we doing? And, said, and afterwards I was, you know, I was talking with somebody and they go, my God, they said, I've never seen somebody take incoming fire like that at a presentation. And just be fine with it. Yeah. And I, and I told him, I go, listen, I go, you have to understand that in my viewpoint, the worst case scenario of that is that it turns into a legit physical confrontation up there <laughs> in that room. Right. And at which point, growing up around who I did and with the construction and everything, like I'm fairly comfortable in that scenario. <laughs> so, what, so what really am I worrying about? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's, there's not a whole lot to sweat it when you get – when you go through that much trial and tribulation and you come out the other side decent with still a fairly positive outlook on life. Yeah. And you know, your, your threshold for what is scary is so much different than everybody else's. Right. That, you know, I look at things here and it's like, you know, you lose a client you're like, Oh, well, 
we'll find another one. Probably yeah. just go find another one in that industry by the end of the day tomorrow if we really want to. Yeah. You know, whereas, you know, most other people in that scenario would probably be hitting the DEF CON 5 button. You know, <laughs> oh my God, all hands on deck. Let's make this happen, right? So, uh, so that was, that was pretty nerve wracking. Other than that, um, you know, I've, I've gone through, uh, you know, a lot of personal issues and things like that, that were pretty, uh, pretty nerve wracking over the years, but you know, you get through all that too. And that's all the same boat as, as well. You know, you go yeah. through, you go through a bad relationship, all of a sudden the next one, you know how to deal, you, you know how to do it better, right? Right. You know how to do it better. You know how to get through it. Um, same thing with business. You go through a couple of bad experiences. Hopefully you learn. You don't make the same mistake again. You grow from it. And, right. you know, and then you're just like a relationship. All of a sudden your expectation of what's actually crazy is a lot different than it was before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I learned a new craziness threshold. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so so I would say that 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 was pretty nerve wracking. But honestly, overall, there's really not too much these days that I have to go through that is like, a, oh man, I'm really really nervous about this. Yeah. Um, because the worst case scenario is is you you not not only that you fail, that you absolutely bomb it. Mm -hmm. You know, that you bomb it, and people say a lot of bad stuff about you, and they question your professionalism and your you know, and honestly, too, your acumen has a business person, you right. know, like, God, that, nobody wants to, anybody to ever say, you know, when you're in this and you're investing your, your blood, sweat and your tears to say, God, that, that guy's a joke, you know, like, <laughs> right. like nobody ever wants to hear that. I mean, I don't mind people saying, you know, he's, that guy's a little out there, right? Like I'm, I'm fine with that. And in marketing, that's the nice thing is you kind of, you almost want to have a little bit of that, right? And right. nobody wants a zany accountant, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> boy, that accountant's crazy, man. He just makes up some stuff right on the fly, you know? Like, nobody wants to hear that. But, you know, with marketing, you want to have, you know, the out-of-the-box thinking and all that. So it's a good fit for, you know, it's always been a good fit. But, um, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff and where we're going with all of this, um, you know, we're accepting, a, we will be accepting a, a, a very big uh, role in the industry as a whole in putting this event together for this national mm -hmm. tour. And there will be a lot of eyes on it. And I won't lie, I'll be a little, you know, I'll be a little nervous about it. I mean, you'd yeah. have to be start mad not to be, you know. Right. Which um, we haven't cleared for sure yet, but. <laughs> this is true. This is true. You're going to have to have another podcast for that one. Okay? <laughs> bring a whole team on to diagnose that one. Um, but, you know, worst case scenario, you bomb big time, things fall apart. And in my case, you just realize you have to start over again then. Yeah. Because right? there is no, there is no end. Sure. Like this is just what it is. Yeah. So, and this is what it is and this is what it's always been and this is what it's always going to be. So if something doesn't work, it's only for the time being. Right. You know, that little venture, that thing there, that was a, that was a disaster. It didn't work out, whatever. We're still doing this, that, and the other thing. And we're going to keep going and, you know, let's give it another shot. Let's keep going with it, you know, so. Sure. So then would you say that, you know, considering the worst case scenario and remembering that it's all part of the process would be kind of how you push past fear or do you have other tools in your toolbox to kind of um, keep moving when you maybe feel that nervousness? I, no, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, yeah. You know, you do, somebody told me a while ago, when you're going through all of that, you have to take a step back and remind yourself of what, what the reason was that you started it to begin with. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have to remember what it looked like before that. And if you liked that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, when, when we're going hundred miles an hour and I, and I can force myself to take a step back now, and look at things from kind of a bird's eye view. And I look at myself as, a, as an individual mm -hmm. and I say, okay, well, what, if I decide all of this isn't worth the stress, then what does my life look like then? Right. right? And usually that is more than enough to give me, you know, the renewed optimism that like, okay, cool. So I definitely don't want that. And like, yeah, this right. sucks right now, but I know I don't want that other thing. Sure. Right. So let's just keep going. And then too, you know, realizing, I mean, I'm 38. And don't get me wrong, I wish I had made a lot of different choices in my 20s, okay? Uh -huh. A ton of different choices. I wish I had spent my money a lot more wisely. <laughs> I wish I had, uh, 
you know, I always say when you're in your 20s, don't think that, you know, partying like you're in the Wolf of Wall Street is going to turn you into the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> that was an anomaly. Nice. All right. Like that does not happen to normal people. Um, so I wish that I had done that differently. But then again, that's who makes you who you are. Sure. And if I hadn't of lived like that, do I then get to the point where I'm 40 or 50 years old and look back and say, damn, you know, I really should have hung out and partied in my twenties a little bit. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're constantly trying to judge all that, but looking at it right now where I'm 38 and I'm sure I will still be working when I'm 68. Yeah. So we have, you know, when I look at like my life and the company and this, that, and the other thing, it is a little bit of a calming effect to realize you've got 30 more years in the game yeah. to perfect this craft. Sure. So don't beat yourself up too much that the last year you've only been able to achieve A, B, and C, right? right? Because if you take that and scale that out over the course of five years, all of a sudden shit looks really impressive. Yeah. But we always want everything yesterday. <laughs> we get really sure. impatient, you know, and right. man, you know, when it's, and and that's, you know, again, where you just have to take the, that thousand foot aerial view right. and realize that, no, that is what the process looks like. Like you said at the beginning, right? 15 years in from being an overnight success. Right. You know, nobody else realizes that, but that's, that's just what it looks like. So I think that realizing how long, when you realize, like I said, like there is no, there is no start and there is no fail. This just is. Yeah. Right. Um, this just is, this is what it's always been. It will always be like that. And you know, the situation of trying to put shit together and trying to build stuff and mm -hmm. that's always going to be what it is. Right. You know, this, everything literally like four different fires could break out right now and destroy all four of those things. Right. And tomorrow morning I would be putting a plan together to how do we get back involved with at least one of them to, from the get go. Right. Literally tomorrow morning, you yeah. know, because sitting around and crying about it is going to do nothing. Sure. And I know what the alternative looks like, and I don't want that. Yeah. So we might as well just get back to work and keep going and, and just accept that it's, you know, it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And, and honestly, too, sometimes people need to be reminded when you go down this road, and we all like to complain, especially <laughs> me. I'm from upstate New York. We are really good at complaining. <laughs> in Syracuse, okay? We are pros at it. But... You know, like, this is what you signed up for. Right. You know, like, what, what did you think you were signing up for, dude? You yeah. know, like you said, you, wa you watched your uncle. Yeah. When I found out, and, and again, you might have to beep this out too, okay? But I have to say it in order to get the I'm glad the you're contact. giving warnings most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> that way Note anyone can ear if they have to. <laughs> Note to editor, beep out in approximately 15 seconds. So, so I figured out, I was like, oh my God, like this summer, and I was probably 19 at the time, this summer is actually going to be his 25th year in business. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, this is incredible, you know? And and I'm much more positive and optimistic than, than he ever was. But I, I told him we were hanging out after work the one day and we're in the shop and I'm like, yo man, I go, listen, do you realize this is going to be year 25? And he goes, huh? I go, this is going to be the 25th year you're in business. And he's like, how do you figure that? And I go, well, you said that the very first thing was, you know, that and I, and this is going to be 25 years. And I, I swear, this is exactly what he did. I was so excited. I figured this out, you know, I'm thinking about like marketing promotions, you know, and like, oh, this, this is so cool. And he literally sat back and said, 25 years of bullshit. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. You know what I mean? That it was like, it was, so, <laughs> hey, it was so deflating for me. Right. Right. But that is, you know, that's what we signed up for though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you don't accept that and come to the conclusion that that's what you signed up for, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. So remind yourself of that constantly and, and try to remain positive, you know? Right. I love that. That's hilarious. So combining the wisdom of your uncle as an entrepreneur and then everything that you have learned so far in your 15 years of overnight success, I'm curious, you've given so much both via the books and other mentors from afar, as I call them, but do you have any other advice that you would like to pass on to our listeners or viewers? 
Um, put, put effort into being organized because his, history is going to repeat itself. And when you start to grow and you start to get going, your time for trying to find this and trying to remember, you know, what those, uh, you know, what, what were those contacts over there and, and, and all of that, like really put a lot of time and effort into your, your customer databases and organizing them and spreadsheets and, and really, really, really try to, to find time to force yourself to do that because there's always a million and one other things and they're usually more pressing. Mm-hmm. Than, you know, going in and sorting things, right? Right. Um, or have somebody get it sorted for you or whatever. But as you get going, the confusion will eventually compound itself. Mm-hmm. And it will start causing uh, the, the stress of taking a little bit of time out to stay organized is nothing compared to the stress of things getting messed up when it mm-hmm. really counts down the road because yeah. we didn't make that a priority, you know? Sure. Um Staying organized and and also to the ability to think creatively and juggle, right? That is something that is really a separating factor. My cousin just moved down here from Rochester and I grew up working with him. He's about 10 years younger than me. It's really cool that he's down here now. It's kind of like a little bit of a reunion thing, you know, and, and I'm really happy that I can, you know, give him a little bit of an opportunity, especially with everything that his dad did for me, right? So... I've got him hooked up with all the real estate investors that I know down here and he's doing the, you know, rehabbing the properties and flipping and all that. And he's like, wow, man, like I, I have more work all of a sudden than I know what to do with. And I keep telling him like, listen, man, the ability to stay organized is going to determine your ability to be successful with that. And I don't care what you're in, you know, like if you, I I always, you know, you, you might be a really good baker, Okay. And you can bake bread and cupcakes and whatever, like better than anybody's business, but staying organized in the art of business is a completely different skill set, mm-hmm. and you can learn it, you right. know, and you can learn it and you can learn it through sheer sweat equity. And I'm a firm believer that you can literally outwork your competition. If you want to, people mm-hmm. say that is a bad strategy. Sometimes that's all you got. Okay. Right. Um, sometimes you don't have enough cash to hire 15 people to handle those 15 things. Okay. And you're stuck up till one o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. every night to get it done. You know what I mean? Um, but, but the ability to stay organized is stay organized and the ability to juggle is one of those innate skill sets that when you get into the, the business end of things outside of just being able to perform your, your skill core craft, is really what determines who is going to be able to win long term and who can't, mm-hmm. you know. And and I think that focusing on that is is really really important because of the stress. When none of us need extra stress, right? You know, I try to I try I try, I try to quote stress that with the clients <laughs> repeatedly. You know, like yeah. the reason why I'm trying to do all of this stuff like this is because I'm trying to keep our stress levels to a minimum mm-hmm. as much as humanly possible because we all have enough of that already. We don't need to be, you know, double communicating and, well, I thought this one was going to do it. No, that one. Did you talk to that one? And like, you know what I mean? Like really, 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 really making a core effort to stay as organized as humanly possible to a fault almost. Mm -hmm. You can go overboard like everything else. But I think that if you get, if you go overboard in organizing, it's, it's very tough to, to see that as almost a bad thing because at that point you've realized you've made it a priority And that's, I mean, I've worked with a lot of companies at this point, a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And the ones that can stay organized and stay, here's another one, stay self-disciplined. Okay. Because once you go into business, guess what? Like me, everybody has ideas for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got opportunities, whether it's with startup or it's with Grizzly or it's, and everybody's pretty sure their idea or what they can bring to the table is priority number one you know, and this is going to be the one that you need and all that. So, you know, staying disciplined to just stay in your lane and stick to the task at hand. And, and as far as marketing goes too, you know, something I struggle with, I've struggled with, with companies over the years is just because you're sick of looking at your marketing message, Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that your target audience is right. Right. You're sick of watching that ad. 
it's still going across all sorts of new people's phones and their screens all day. You right. know, they're not sick of it. You're sick of it because you've been staring at it for six months every single day looking at the, you know what I mean? Yeah. That doesn't mean that your audience is sick of it though. So if something seems to be working, like stop trying to broke, uh, fix something that's not broke. Right? right. And I think a lot of times, you know, we end up in positions where it's more fun to tinker with things <laughs> than it yeah. is to roll up our sleeves and just do what we have to do. Yeah. Like today I have to go into, when we're done with this, I have to go into the QuickBooks account for the properties and I have to go in there and get a little bit of a mess that's happened in there over the last month cleaned up. I right. hate that. I yeah. absolutely despise doing it. But again, it's one of those things where the company is only so big and I'm really the only one that understands what's truly going on there from all aspects, right? So I'm just going to have to do it. And I can assure you there was a million and one things that I would rather be doing once we get off the phone. Okay. Sure. I'm curious about the organization thing you were talking about. So you put that as a priority and I'm thinking, I'm wondering if he's going to hire somebody to go to his mailbox, take care of the <laughs> mail, recycle the junk mail, put the water bill on auto pay so, <laughs> so that you don't have to have the stress of not being able to shower before one of these. I No, and honestly, I had to go to the real estate <laughs> office and shower about three months ago because it, it has not gotten paid. Um, Yes. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually am in the point of getting that taken care of because that's actually turned into a huge issue for me. I'm sure. You know, which is <laughs> like, I'm managing all of this stuff. Like who the hell is managing my personal life at this point? Right. Like, like, yeah, th these things are going great and all that. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, that's wonderful. You know, I've been wearing the same socks for three days in a row <laughs> <laughs> because I haven't had time to do any laundry over there, right? Right. And, That's you know, what and you delegate. That is what we have to do, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you and here's another it. thing is, let's be honest, when you're going 100 miles an hour like this, it can take its toll on relationships, right? And it, right. it will make relationships very, very tough, too. Um, everything, if you're going to do it, requires somebody's ability to commit to it to see it through. Right. And that is, you know, maybe that's something we could go back to talking about, you know, what is it that I kind of worry about sometimes? Yeah. You know, because I find, I find my, you know, the, the last thing I was in was for about eight years and that didn't really work out too well. And, you know, now I'm like, I'm now I'm in the situation where I've taken that, that fallout mm -hmm. and channeled all this energy back into what it is that I'm doing and like have like quadrupled everything. Right. Within a year now, because I'm like, no, I'm going to take that, that whole negative year that I was dealing with that. We're going to put this behind us and now we're going to go full steam. And this is what my purpose is now and blah, blah, blah. Honestly, like looking at it, like where on earth do you fit a relationship yeah. in with this? I mean, it, yeah, that's it's one thing you definitely can't delegate is the relationship. No, you can't, you know, and, and that is something there, you know, like with that, boy, that would be nice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, so, so it's, it's tough, but yeah, I've got a couple of things in place where we are going to delegate. Ex ex I laugh and call it, you know, um, God, what, actually, you know what? I'm not even going to say the term that we <laughs> came up for that, but try to try to get some of that stuff taken care of so right. that it's not still on my plate. Right. Because that is, that is the little things. And when, when, when your home life is piling up and it's spiraling out of control, it does have an effect on work. Sure. And, and if you, you know, and if you're going home to a miserable situation every day, was work really worth it then? Right. You know, and that for me is like what that whole work-life balance thing is that everybody talks about. It's not, it's not, you know, figuring out like the actual time and whatnot. It's just like, how is this even possible? Right. You know, like what is the scenario where this is possible? So for like me right now, I'm like, okay, I guess this is impossible right now. And I'm cool with that. And, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, when, when it, when it is, I'm, I'm pretty good at putting things together. I'm sure I can get that taken care of too. Go. Okay. But <laughs> you know, for the time, for the time being, that's, you know, that is what it is. So right. yes, we have, we have something in place now to get the mail taken care of. And some of these things that need <laughs> to be, sucks. some of these things need to be, uh, <laughs> yes, some of these things that need to be on auto pay, you know, and, and get, 
you know, just get some of that stuff streamlined at the house. You know, right. I don't have a half a day to sit there and do all of it. Right. I really don't. So instead, I just end up trying to piece everything together, and it causes more chaos and more stress. So yeah, stay organized. So yeah, you're going to take costs. your own advice soon. I, Make I try. <laughs> well, with the relationship thing, it seems like you've got a healthy attitude toward it that, you know, maybe this isn't the season for it now. And not to speak in cliche, but it could just be that eventually you'll find the an equal hustler. That, yeah, um, I mean, or, or the exact opposite. Or that, you know? yeah. My I husband mean, definitely, like, I can identify when you're saying, like, that just sounds terrible. I don't want to not work when I'm 68 or whatever. Right. I lose my mind. We were talking about our honeymoon yesterday, and he's like, why are you so stressed out? I'm like, I don't know how to not work for a month. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, can we combine that with a trade show or something? <laughs> so I can definitely identify that that's a balanced thing, too, for sure. It, it, it really is, you know, and, every, and everything goes in cycles. You know, and, and again, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And, and when it doesn't, you just kind of pick up the pieces and okay, well, let's keep moving. Right. You know, so. Yeah. All right. Well, my last question for you, um, maybe thinking back to hanging out with your uncle, but I, this is my favorite question to ask. And it's if eight-year-old Jeremy had a crystal ball and could look at 38 year old Jeremy and everywhere you've been in between as well as you know your foreseeable future like you have your drop zone events planned out right. you kind of know what's going on in the next few months god willing um on a scale of 1 to 11 how excited would little Jeremy be to see where you are now oh god that's a tough one um I would say I would say if we could how clear is this crystal ball? There has been a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of, of, of emotional stuff and, and, and pain and things like that. So, I mean, would, would eight-year-old me looking at where we're at right now say, God, I can't wait to go. I, I think I would say go. I can't wait to get to that point. Sure. But the process would scare the living hell out of me. No doubt. Right. I mean, it's still, I, I still look back at all of it. I'm like, I don't even know how I got through a lot of this, right? Like just yeah. I, no clue. So, so the process would be the horrifying. Laying on the <laughs> like suspense and curiosity. But. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on one second. Let me, I got to get this audio fixed back up here. <laughs> Are we good? Can you hear okay, me? Okay, let me can I, let me see if I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. No, I was just saying you're really laying on some pretty hardcore curiosity and suspense with the. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that will all come out at some point, probably in about twenty years. Okay, <laughs> not before that. So we'll just do that. Is just okay. going to have to be a to be uh, to be continued. Um, just a lot of craziness. Uh, you know, nothing nothing like an, oh my God type scenario sure. from, the, uh, well, actually, I mean, probably, honestly, most people would say, oh my God. Yeah. But <laughs> for, for me, I'm like, oh, you know, just crazy kids being crazy kids. But right. it, you know, there was a lot of uh, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think that to, to get to this point now, yeah, yeah. I would look at, at where everything is at right now and say, holy cow. Now, when I was eight, I wanted to be a dog when I grew up. Okay. That's awesome. and, yeah, my parents would, I would, you know, my mom would have me at the store and I'd be on all fours and I'd be barking at people. Okay? <laughs> so I probably wouldn't be terribly thrilled that this is what happened when I was eight. But <laughs> by the time I was like 13, I think I was, I was like, I'm going to be an architect. Okay. You know, I'm going to be an architect. And then that changed and then this changed and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty exciting point to be at where we're at right now. It's a lot of work. It's very stressful, but um, you know, for all intents and purposes, anybody that's ever wanted to go down that entrepreneurial path yeah. to go through all of the the headaches and, and and all of that stuff and and come out of it and end up in this situation right now is um, I I think it's a it's a pretty fantastic situation myself. So yeah, I love it. Well, lots of upside. 
Good. You can't be you can a guy, ask for but no? yeah. <laughs> so on a scale of one to 11, where would you put that with the outcome? Um, I, how about a solid seven? All right. Take it. <laughs> how about and, a solid seven? And I guess we'll just have to wait for your version of shoe dog. To yeah, yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> at, at least, at least, yeah. I don't. But because here's the thing too: is that you know you have to remember too when you're getting into a lot of this stuff. And we so at one point we tried to like start live streaming all of our meetings here. Yeah. Well, we're gonna live stream our Monday morning meetings, and it's like there is such a thing as being too transparent. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. They're like, no, you gotta let them in. You gotta share. No, I'm sorry. Like, no, there's some stuff that you just you know. Yeah. People shouldn't share it, you know, like, <laughs> not if you're trying to, you know, generate more clients, right. you know, like, like, again, you know, calling your thing freaking half cool, half crazed advertising. <laughs> Let's at least get our foot in the door before we start, you know, explaining what, you know, <laughs> one time when I was 17. You know? <laughs> once, that's, once that's out there in book form, it's out there forever. Right. right. So. Sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing as much as you did. I do oh, you appreciate got it. that. And it was really a pleasure to talk with you. So excited to see where you are and where you go. No, you're great. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. And uh, by all means, let me know, you know, if there's anything, whatever, anything comes up. This was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Awesome. I had a blast too. All right. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I definitely was energized by it. And like I said, it really provoked a lot of thought for me to think about, you know, whether I should be focusing on just one thing or going in a lot of directions. I know I've said in the past that I love both ideas. So it's interesting to have Joe's example from a couple of weeks ago where she's really focusing on one thing and the same thing with the advice that I gave to Kara last week and then to contrast it against this idea of like go after everything and make it happen and do it fast and don't be afraid to fail. So I love the ideas. I'm definitely energized by this conversation and I hope that you were too. If you were, please subscribe. That way you'll get an automatic notification or download when there are new episodes and spoiler alert, there is a new one coming this Friday with a challenge from Jeremy to help you get a little closer to your dreams and outside of your comfort zones, as is the goal of the podcast, of course. And instead of doing a giveaway with this episode, there's actually going to be a giveaway with that Fearless Fridays challenge. So make sure you stay tuned for it and make sure you are ready to get your hands dirty. Well, not necessarily. I don't really even know what the challenge is yet, but I am sure it will be interesting and exciting. So stay tuned for that. Also, please share this with anyone who you think would love to hear this message. As I said, I'm trying to impact as many people as possible and get them making bold moves themselves. So if you pop this onto your Twitter, your Facebook, send it via email or text to anyone who you think would like it, I would really appreciate it. And while you're doing me favors, I would love it if you sub or in iTunes left reviews or any other application you're on because that has iTunes suggesting this podcast to other people. So the more ears and eyeballs we get on this the more happy that I am because the closer we get to my goals so I hope you're enjoying this I hope you stay tuned and as always I hope you be bold and have a sparkly day bye-bye